Hi, I'm Doug Connect, the Dean of Children's Programs here at Bank Street School for Children. I'm going to be talking with Dr. Mary Helen Imordino Yang, who is a professor of education, psychology, and neuroscience at the University of Southern California. Mary Helen is also the director of CANDLE, the Center for Effective Neuroscience Development, Learning, and Education. And CANDLE aims to bring educational innovation and developmental effective neuroscience into partnership using what is learned in their research to guide the transformation of schools, policy, and the student and teacher experience for a healthier and more equitable society. I am thrilled to be able to talk with Mary Helen today and share this with you. I hope you enjoy. It's great to be with you, Mary Helen. Let's just jump right in and talk about the opportunity that adolescents provide to yeah. do the thinking that you're saying that is both big picture while also kind of holding on to concrete fact skills and the relational pieces of like how to work with other other human beings in productive and meaningful ways. So, I mean, that's where this feels like it's going in my in my understanding of your work in terms of this conversation, but I'm not sure that's where you were planning to go. No, I, I think, no, that's, that's totally right. So let, let me like expound on that. Sure. I mean, I think for for little kids, we have a much better sense of the kinds of sort of, now I'll put my sort of developmentalist hat on, right? The kinds of mental work they're doing to be able to build new insights, to be able to you know, discover for themselves the things they need to have noticed about the world so that you don't have to actually reinvent everything. You can, you can pick up from the cultural space that is the legacy of our, of our, you know, of, of our human history and take it from there. We, in our traditional uh, educational approaches in adolescence, have transitioned, you know, sort of into a space where if you may, you know, if you're doing this kind of high level thinking in adolescence, it's about acquiring lots of information about what's happened before in this kind of discrete procedural semantic way. And we talk about learning and learning outcomes as your ability to, in a kind of transactional or sometimes critical, you know, way, put together lots of pieces of information and, um, you know, quickly manipulate that information, reason about it um, in such a way that you, you now, um, you know, integrate and produce some kind of solution or calculation that um, is intended, right? That basically it's already been decided for you but you're, you're supposed to sort of create it on the fly. And there's a lot of value in that. Being able to do that has value. If you can't do that, that can be a hindrance, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, that's not enough. So throughout adolescence, the ways that little kids, you know, are playing with these realizations and these connections, adolescence is about playing with these realizations and connections, but in the space of what I would call transcendent realization. So you're moving from uh, context dependent knowledge, the things you can do and know and notice in a particular situation. They're really, really working at this space of learning to take many context dependent ways of understanding something or manipulating information or reasoning about the information uh, procedurally acting on the information, noticing things, right? Taking those things, and that's usually where we stop. That's usually what excellent education looks like. We stop there, learn to notice, learn to manipulate, learn to reason about it, learn to, right? But what's really powerful for the development of adolescents is what they're doing when they're trying to find the pattern that is, you know, the shared feeling, the shared interest, the shared value, the shared sort of idea that unites many kinds of contexts. So one thing I would push back on when you said, Doug, that they need to do this transcendent thinking while also holding on to the right, I would say it in a more integrated way. I would say they need to take these contextual things and by holding them in mind, recognize how you could reconcile or coordinate them to infer some bigger idea, value, belief. And what adolescence is really about is being able, it, it is like really working in that inferential process. You're engaging with these context-dependent things, 
but then you're also learning how to notice that there are systematic sort of properties or 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 um, or ideas, you know, that are that are moving that are that are general to all of these all of these ways of thinking, and you start to recognize those, and then you start to impose those on new contexts that you get into, and then you might might, might not work. And then you have to rework them. And then you're constantly, that's what challenging your own beliefs is actually, right? It's moving in and out of this space. And of course, any new skill that you're learning to manage cognitively is messy, especially dynamic and messy and context dependent and emotionally fraught at the beginning. It always is. Watch a tiny little baby who is just about to go from being able to sit to being able to crawl, right? I mean, it's like, or just about to roll over, right? They're super frustrated with themselves. They know what they want. And it's not just to be oriented the other way. If you come over and flip them over for them, that doesn't help, right? They wanna be able to do what they're trying. They're like trying to get their hand to go at the same time as their knee. And it's like, ah, you know? And, and, and then they can do it and they suddenly make this huge leap in development. Adolescence looks like that. All human development looks like that, right? It's just easier to see it with babies. Adolescence looks like that, but what's the, it's trying to notice these values and beliefs and then apply them in the world, but then you get pushed back that that's not actually relevant here, or maybe your value is, or your belief is, is not fully correct. And you have to keep challenging it and trying to manage that transition from working in the world to what does it all mean? And in doing that, you do things like you create a sense of self that is emergent out of moving yourself between these context dependent ways of working and noticing in the world and the big level of meaning making that you're building yourself. You're building a sense, a subjective sense of having experienced this and of it's me agentically figuring out what I believe about this or what I understand about this. That process is where the identity is actually being built. The identity is an emergent, capacity that comes out of that grappling what what's an example you feel like that could be relatable right to teachers um so take for example you know one of the examples of a of a of a of a teacher that we feature in our study of teachers so and she's in the bronx i think right it was one of the math teachers um that we featured uh where she built out this algebra 2 curriculum around uh, you know, quadratic equations and exponential growth, and then had the kids assigned to work with a family from their community to, to be their financial planner and figure out, oh, so this is how many years it would take to pay off your mortgage if your house costs like this and your kids need college tuition and you want to also save for retirement and, right, how do you invest now so that later it'll be worth this much and all those kinds of things, right? So the kids are grappling, and she even says this in a little video clip we have, they're grappling with the, the mathematical doing, right? The being able to reason and correctly calculate and understand the, the relationships that are nonlinear between the input numbers and the output growth over time, right? All of that stuff. But she doesn't stop there the way most math curricula do. do. She then puts that into the context where they have to manage it themselves as a financial planner. So they are translating between the, the numbers and the equations and the reasoning and all that and the bigger picture of what it would mean for somebody's life and their life plan and what they would do. And they sit in the middle helping the family see those relationships back and forth. So what does that do? It is deeply motivating and identity building to the kid because now you become the, the, your identity now becomes one that incorporates the ability to calculate quadratic equations and understand exponential growth as a piece of how you understand and behave and notice in your community in a relationship. That's why it's such a powerful learning opportunity compared to just, just doing the math and moving from there, right? or just helping the families and doing community service, which many schools have worked in, right? 
which again is kind of hollow. It doesn't actually help your academic learning very much, right? I mean, it feels nice to go serve at the soup kitchen and it's useful service to your community, but that doesn't help your math skills, right? So what, you, we, what we really want to think about for teenagers is building out curricula where they can find applications of their skills that feel authentic to them. And sometimes, and then move between these things that they notice. And sometimes for some kids, it's going to feel authentic to them just to be able to make connections to big mathematical ideas, right? It doesn't actually have to be a person in their community for it to feel like me. And that's like the example of the of the kid in the, you know, the math class in our article from 2020 in, in Ed Leadership, right? Where this, where this kid who's never passed a math class before at age 18, or maybe never even had a math class before at age 18, right? Is talking about how he was given this problem of Zeno's paradox walking to the door. And he had to think about fractions because he got fascinated by finite and infinite and he's moving back and forth. So, and then he says it, be, it became relevant to my life or something like that at the end, right? And many kids in those videos said something about it becoming relevant to their life. So relevance isn't just, you can help a family in your community, that's a kind of relevance, but there's another kind of relevance, which is entirely fabricated in the social cultural space of the feeling of knowing. And we often neglect that, right, as a source of relevance, but in teenager land, that's a hugely important source of relevance. There's a particular thing I think that struck my attention almost a decade ago that you and your team have been working on around uh, networks that are in the brain and how they function um, and how they are associated with different kinds of thinking and kind of emerging capacity uh, capacities that we have from childhood into adolescence, um, thinking that's concrete. Uh, and how that is kind of related to or different from more abstract thinking. Which basically means integrating across, holding in mind many kinds of context dependent thinking right. and then inferring the broader principle that holds right. them together. So, so you don't just so go is, to here without having a lot of this, right? Right. So that's not divorcing anything from it, you know, other part. It's integrating. It's um, an extra level of now emergent capacity to, un to understand or notice something, a pattern in the things that before you were just in. Right. Yeah. And some of that noticing is really directed emotionally in, in ways and cognitively because they're connected um, by the salience network in the brain is what I'm understanding. You're that's talking what about, we right? think that it's part of it. Yeah, that's what we think. And that can help us direct our attention when we can define attention in different ways. Yeah, it's going to be very different, but it, it'll help you sort of um, manage yourself toward a particular kind of engagement with the world let's put it that way and then and that engagement is actually the work of the executive network is why my understanding well, right well now. yeah part, yeah i mean you can sort of think of it that way these are all pretty concrete statements and we are honestly don't understand everything about this but yes yeah i can see your i can see your hesitance to agree with anything i'm saying well, I just don't i mean it comes to the brain i'm hesitant to say like it is this spot oh no yeah. it's not spots anymore well, it's this you know, I'm it's, it's the capacity that is the whole head, okay, and partly body too, to sort of manage yourself into this space. We see that these regions that we have called the executive capacity network, right, the executive control network, are systematically tend to be in, deeply involved in the ability to manage yourself in this way. So yes. So like there's a, there's associations when this is yeah, happening in yeah, the brain. Yeah, these things seem to be very much involved. Those we, that we network see... of regions and their co uh, activation or deactivation seems to be very much involved in these capacities, yeah. So I'll, I'll try to step out of having like a direct narrative uh, that's so simple and say, so during this time in adolescence and into young adulthood, the way that you, you know, you, you could try to address the issues that you've talked about where we're trying to support kids into having more success in the larger world and young people, by directing their attention constantly, which some you know schools and a lot of curriculum does, like do this and then do this and then do this, and act this way and look over here and then you know the bell rings and you go over there and you do this and you do this, that from your you know your research and the, and others in the last few decades implies that we're losing out on that opportunity to have not only like the bigger picture thinking formulated from all of that context dependent stuff, 
we may be losing the opportunity to do the very thing you said you just said feels so important to to us as a you know as a as a as a you know our society our our school certainly here at bank street believes this so deeply that to be able to reflect not just on what works or what doesn't in, in a social context or you know ideas that could could work for some but not others but like to step out and have that meta process um where you're thinking about your own thinking or you're contemplating your own beliefs or that of others and in context or that, or that and, and your own thinking might be the idea you have about gravity rolling balls down ramps right like it doesn't yeah. have to just be social beliefs that is a great point so that ability has to be also nurtured in schools if not elsewhere in society <laughs> um in and in people's homes and what we haven't talked about yet is this default mode network right which is associated with that kind of work that the brain does from what i've learned um and so i mean i guess the thing that i wonder about is when you and and that we mentioned earlier that some of these things that are happening in the brain don't all happen simultaneously they happen you know like you've mentioned in the past that the default mode network and the executive network don't they toggle right yeah and they're so, co-regulating one another is co what we think is going on yeah yeah so i mean what you know this is what you and i have been trying to work on through this re more recent study like what yeah. what do we think we're learning what what are you excited about that you're seeing that could be guidance or things that you would want educators to help us think about that's coming out of your current research yeah in yeah, this, yeah in this space right here like what it means to try to engage kids in that growing of their brains in that way and their selves they're thinking of themselves and the world in that way yeah well, a couple of things, I, you know, I'm going back to my mom who raised four hot blooded, crazy kids. I was the oldest of which, <laughs> right, where she said, geez, you teach your teenagers, your kids to think critically, to, to really reflect, to, to, you know, stand up for what they believe in. And then you got to deal with it. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I mean, Fair like, enough. I don't think that society necessarily uh, you know, is ready for for a generation of kids who are really pushing and 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 trying to deeply understand the the logic and the and the reasoning behind systems and the values and beliefs that are implicit in the ways our structures are set up. Right? I mean, it's it's it makes things difficult for us grownups when kids start asking questions. Right? So so expect pushback okay we would much rather you know have although not this is very short-sighted but we would much rather have a bunch of complicit pawns who just put their heads down and can do what they're supposed to be able to do to be able to do this job effectively right so i think there's going to be a lot of pushback and as educators recognize that right um and there's also pushback from parents because parents are afraid Right, they're afraid for their kids. I mean, I raised two kids who are now, you know, emerging adult, late teen, emerging adult, right? And you know, it's like you are you are worried that you're gonna, right? Like, can you really trust that this person, if you give them this freedom and this space and these expectations and these kinds of supports, but you don't do it for them, are they really gonna make it, right? And, um, and you know, that's frightening. And what happens when we're worried, when we're frightened, when we don't truly trust that, that, that they, can, they can, you know, be capable of their own journey? You hunker down on control, right? You micromanage and you make things more concrete. And that's what we see over and over again in educational spaces. But the deep irony is that produces a kind of complicitness in, in the system that for some just plain serves them badly for others produces a loss of agency which is which is deeply sort of emptying of 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 well-being right we, when we see a mental health crisis around this right now so um the finding that we had in our data that i think was really like uh, whoa, kind of finding in the brain, which I think is really interesting, is that when we engaged teenagers, they were between 15 and 14 and 18 years old, okay? So 
you know, mid-adolescence, when we engage teenagers, most of them were 15 or so, incoming ninth and 10th graders. Um, uh, when we engage kids in reacting to these true documentary stories about teenagers in all kinds of extraordinary situations around the world, right? And ask them like, what does the person's story make you feel? Like, how do you feel about this, right? Um, what we saw is that kids were systematically struggling to try to make meaning of these really deeply compelling stories and to understand them in ways that um, were very variable across kids, but we were able to sort of build out statistically in terms of factor analysis and things like that for those of you who care, but also in terms of sort of theoretical orientation, two big kinds of thinking, both of which had many different kinds of thinking subsumed within it, right? And one was this more sort of context dependent, empathic, direct way of thinking about stuff. Like here's this girl in Pakistan, you know where that is? And like, she wants to go to school and become a doctor someday, but then there's this group called the Taliban, you know who they are, let me tell you about them. So they believe that, you know, girls shouldn't go to school and like, you know, here's what happened and here's an interview with her, with her dad, you know, how does this story make you feel, right? So you can directly and should directly react to the girl and say like, this is happening to her, that's not fair, that makes me upset. But then kids also would go into this other space where they're like, wait a minute, I didn't know not everybody in the world gets to go to school. Like, Maybe I should, and then they come back to themselves, right? Maybe I should be thinking more about the opportunities I have to go to school and leveraging them better because I could do something about this maybe if I, right? So the kids are building these different thought spaces inside of deciding how they feel as part of their grappling to understand the story. What we found is that that was really, I think, scientifically super interesting is that when the kids then one by one, you know, they were interviewed for two hours about these stories and then they went in the, MRI scanner and they watched, you know, just a, a five second clip of each story followed by a long gray screen, you know, um, you know, and they see Malala saying like, they can't stop me. I'll go to school here, there or anywhere, right? And it just stops and they get this long gray screen and they can think about how they feel and they can push buttons to say how strongly they're engaged with it at that moment, how strongly emotionally they feel that. And what we found is that systematically we could predict, and this is published in, in the journal Social Cognitive Affective Neuroscience in, in uh, 2022, I think, if you're interested. But systematically we could predict that the way that the executive control network regions and the so-called default mode regions, which are regions that are activated concertedly, highly, metabolically expensive, right? They take a ton of glucose and oxygen to ramp these things up, fire these things up. But they are concertedly activated for all kinds of thinking that basically isn't in the here and now. It's not things you can directly observe and notice or infer directly from the situation. You have to actually reflect in a broader, more of what we're calling transcendent way. It's, it's kind of the feeling of what it all means, right? It's also autobiographical memory is involving the system, daydreaming is involving the system, you know, all kinds of um, things that, you know, are not things you can directly sort of observe from the world that you have to construct mentally. Um, and what we saw is that those two networks, and, and other people have shown this, uh, that when people are thinking divergently, like really creatively about complex problems, when people are engaging with um, sort of moral judgments and things like that, you see these networks trading off with one another. Only one can sort of be active at a time um, because they're kind of, you know, the, 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 the network properties are almost like the toggling of a seesaw, right? So you can either be thinking about what you're noticing and watching and seeing and saying, I feel so bad for her, let me give her a hug. Or you can kind of think about, well, wait a minute, not everybody in the world, right, gets to go to school. Well, what does that mean, right? It's like toggling away where what Malala looks like doesn't matter anymore. What that situation in Pakistan is also doesn't matter anymore. It just becomes one of those context dependent situations in which you're pulling these different things together to make this bigger idea that we talked about before. So kids are showing us they're doing that. What we found that was, I think, so fascinating is that when kids, systematically were engaging networks around thinking about these bigger implications, what we saw, like based on a story, they did this to a story, what happens when they see that story uh, in the scanner an hour later, 
what we saw is that there was this very systematic pattern of activation and deactivation of the executive control network regions and the default mode regions. So what we found is that statistically speaking, default mode would come up, would be very active when they were going to have, when they had had this very transcendent way of thinking about the story. Okay. So that makes sense. We knew that. And we expected executive control networks also to be involved because it takes effort, right? And focus to be able to not just wallow in sadness over the situation, but actually make sense out of it and really grapple with what it means. And what we saw is that the executive control network on average, right, would be active very early on in the trial. So, you know, in the first four seconds, keep in mind the blood flow is what we're measuring and it takes it a couple of seconds for us to be able to measure. The, the firing doesn't result in immediate blood flow. There's a lag. So all of this stuff is just like squinting through a glass darkly to see what's going on in the brain, all right? So we'll just be clear about that. But what okay. we see is that there's more blood flow coming up at the beginning of the, of the trial, right? In the executive control when they've had this transcendent thinking. And then the executive capacity regions go deeply quiet. They are profoundly deactivated below the level of just like default baseline when they're just resting in the scanner or like the average across the whole hour they're in the scanner. It's like they are purposefully suppressing the activity in these executive control regions as the default comes to a really high level of activity. And when that happens, and especially if the kid says to us in real time by pushing buttons, I'm really emotionally engaged with what I'm thinking about right now, we can statistically, all of those things additively <laughs> explain variants, so to speak, additively, all those things together tell us, wow, it's really likely they made a very transcendent big picture construal of this story, right? When they were in, talking about it in the interview. What was so interesting is that, and I don't know that anybody has described this before, is that the executive control regions had to profoundly deactivate in order for these bigger, kinds of understanding to come to fruition is what the data look like. Mm. So we think in education as more executive control is better. But like the brilliant Carol Lee, right, who's, who's uh, you know, an amazing emeritus professor at, at Northwestern and now the president of the National Academy of Education and a whole bunch of things, Right, so what Carol once asked me very cogently when she first heard about these findings is Mary Helen, she just heard executive control and her knee jerk reaction is executive control in the service of what? And the answer to her is, well, what it looks like is executive control in the service of marshalling your mind into an effortful space for deep reflection and meaning making in which you integrate these different pieces and try to figure out what it all means. And so, high levels of executive functioning in this, what it looks like to us is not a lot of putting the kibosh on stuff. It's, in, you know, a negative inappropriate stuff, which is how we think about executive control in education. It's like keeping yourself from stomping out of the room when you're frustrated or punching the person in the face when you're mad, right? That's what executive control is. That and only that, that's important, but that's like a this big part of it, right? When in effect, what it might be is a capacity that you enact dynamically. It's the capacity to dynamically pull it together, but then relax that control in order to be able to build a more divergent, free-flowing kind of narrative meaning, which is the stuff of, you know, sort of deep values and beliefs and identities. Those are not linear little chains of reasoning. Those are the feeling of the meaning of the entirety of the thing when you consider all of it in one space together. So, so what I think was, is really exciting about these data is it really speaks, they really speak to executive capacity as being, I mean, executive control as being not a, an ability you can just have more of, right? But it might be more useful to think of it as a capacity that you situationally enact, adaptively enact in accordance with the demands of the situation in order to make the kind of meaning that's appropriate in that situation. So if you're in the middle of playing a soccer game and you like start 
you know, in your executive capacity, you need to focus on the ball and the, and the team and the who's where and like, what, you know, the goal is that way. And like, my job is, is to kick it to her, not to run all the way to the goal, right? Like that kind of be, be able to manage yourself in space is super important. And if you start, you know, suddenly musing in your head about the, you know, the power of Title IX and girls' access to sports, all of a sudden, look, you're going to get hit in the head with the ball, right? But at the same time, when you're, you know, walking home afterward, the space to be able to kind of let down that outer vigilance and use your executive capacity to marshal your mind into a space where you can pull in the relative elements all onto one working you know, space and start to manipulate those and kind of metabolize those in a way that enables you to see the connections, the coordination. That's what executive control in adolescence may actually be about, but that's not necessarily how we think about it. The other super cool thing that your team found is that the folks who could do that at 15, 14 and 15 and do it well, right? Predicted that they could they could grow that capacity when they were older, right? All right let me just say, so yeah, so so let me just say, so it's not about the ones that can do it, right? Sorry. It's yes. the ones who did do it. <laughs> who did do it. Yeah. Yes. Who showed, who showed this pattern. It really mattered. Every kid, we had 65 kids, right? From schools all over the city, you know, their IQs range from, you know, our testing of them, 79 to 131 or something like that, like a huge range of kids, okay? All of them passing all their classes at school, none of them in trouble. That was kind of where we started from, right? Like just like the range of kids who are out there, like, you know, and every kid in the experiment across a two hour interview, uh, we also had many other interviews about the violence they've witnessed in their community, how they make sense of it and everything, which we talk about in the 2020 article in that leadership deck. Um, yeah. But th we had to have one standard interview where everybody's talking about the same stuff so that we can actually do science, okay? Um, uh, so so what we did there was, you know, we had the same 40 stories, many different kinds of stories. There's got something in there for everybody, right? The stories were super compelling, okay? Um, and so what we found is that every kid, you know, engaged in this kind of transcendent thinking at least a couple of times. I think the range, it's reported in the, in the paper, which is, you know, now preprint. The range is like, three to 67 times showing across the, okay. right, across the, right? So every kid did it at least some. So that tells us that every kid can do it. Right. Now the question that's more interesting is do they, right? And so we're thinking of it kind of like exercise, you know, most people can exercise, but only if you do it, will you actually enjoy the health benefits, right? And it actually doesn't matter how talented you are for sports or how, uh, you know, how, uh, 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 you know, skilled you are in the domain of exercising, if you start exercising more, you will reap benefits from that. And, and it's like that. That's what we see. It doesn't matter what your IQ is. It doesn't matter what your family's socioeconomic status is in our data set, okay, which is only 65 kids. So, you know, mm -hmm. But it's very robust in our data set that if you were inclined toward doing this kind of work in that interview, where you're really trying to grapple with the transcendent meaning, then what we saw is that that transcendent meaning making, the degree to which a kid was inclined to grapple with stuff, regardless of what they actually decided about the meaning of the story, right? Um, the degree to which kids were inclined to grapple with stuff was would predict, and this is like the holy grail of science, like we predict the future development of that kid's brain. So, so, and this is the part the scientists reviewers are having so much trouble with right now, but I think educators will get it. It doesn't predict the, the, the kind of brain the kid has at the start or even at the end point. It does not predict the level of connectivity between these networks. The grappling predicts the degree of change across the two scans. So we bring them back two years later, we scan them again, scan them here, we, right, at the same day, and then we scan them two years later, and we look at, compared to yourself two years ago, how much have you grown yourself? Also controlling for the starting point, okay. Uh, uh -huh. Let's uh -huh. take care. Right, how much do you grow yourself? And so the scientists are like, wait, this doesn't make sense, that everybody should be converging on a kind of brain that is good for you to have. And you're like, no, 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 right? Think about it this way. Think about it the way pediatricians think about infant growth, right? You know, as someone who had two very small children, uh, you know, physically small, I, I can tell you like, 
what the pediatrician cared about is how much milk they're drinking, they're taking, and then how their weight is changing across the visits. What she's trying to figure out is, are they on a healthy growth trajectory? Not, are they a large size child, right? right? Different kids are on different curves. Some children are going to be very large children. Some children like mine are gonna be very petite children. That's not correlated with health. Health comes from the curve you're on, right? right. So what we have predicted here is not what curve, you know, whether you're a big child or a little child, it's, you know, physically in stature, it's how robustly are you growing yourself? How actively are you growing yourself? And that change across the two years is predicting, robustly predicting identity development measures another year and a half later, which is when you really should be grappling with you know, who am I? I've, I, you know, it's, it's a standard Ericksonian kind of an updated version of Erickson's questionnaire. Questions like, you know, I've spent time and effort thinking about what's best for me and what I believe in and, and, and how I want to live my life, right? Um, uh, you know, as compared to questions like, you know, it negatively predicts questions like, uh, I just hang with the crowd, right? You know, kind of whatever they think is what I go along with sort of thing, right? I, I sometimes participate in activities when asked, but I rarely try anything new on my own. You know, that kind of stuff, right? Where, you know, that's not really great for you. And so what so we Mary Helen, can I can I take a shot and then you'll correct me because I probably won't yeah. get it right. Yeah, so no. there was a student, a young person who was measured in that initial um, trial set of trials, having fewer um, examples of that uh, transcendent and abstract thinking and toggling with the concrete um, that projected a kind of a, you know less growth in that over time. Less growth in the metric. Their brain was more the same. More, it was more Two similar. Later, they yeah. had not changed it as much. Right. In and, the beneficial and, direction. And then they were their responses on the Erickson like tool was more uh, likely to be I just hang with the crowd. Yeah. Uh, no, I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about what I really, what's good for me and what's best for me. Nah, low on that. I mean, you know, so the implication I know that you and I have been trying to grapple with is like, so if that's true and that's, you know, we want all kids to be on a great growth trajectory, not to have the same brain or not. Yeah, they're not going to have the same brain, um, right? That's, right. That's, that doesn't, that's not, and that's not our job to make them have the same brains any more than it's our job to make sure that my daughter who was born at five pounds, six ounces full term is now six feet tall. Like that's just not in her purview genetically or whatever, but it doesn't matter. She can be a healthy, robust, strong, athletic kid. There, there are, there are, I don't know if you want to call it an assumption or value orientations that we have in this, which is to be able to do that kind of thinking and then have that as it is associated with that kind of measure of identity. We're, you know, we're also defining what health is right or, or he more healthy yes we are and that's value that's our value being imposed yeah. the data right i believe and actually there are data to show that figuring out who you are and what matters to you and what's best for you and what you believe in and trying the things that you want to try regardless of other people think that it's good you're right but it's the stuff you think would be interesting that makes you happy and in fact our even in our data there is this like Point oh 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 two right relationship like p value like that's super very strong relationship <laughs> between identity the identity measure three and a half years after the start of the study and then at age 20 21 years old how much they report they're satisfied with their life themselves their relationships things like self liking like you know a question we made which is basically toggle the little thing back and forth. Um, you know, I, uh, it, you know, how satisfied are you with the person whom you've become, right? They're really satisfied, not satisfied, right? Like it's predicting things that we think are good for everybody. Being satisfied with who you are as a person, being satisfied with your relationships. We have a whole list of relationships and they can slide the little toggle. This is how satisfying I found my relationship with my own child or my boss at work or my teacher, my parent, my partner, my whatever, right? We have all these things. You can just pick the ones that matter for you, you know? They are subjectively telling us later, I like myself and I'm satisfied with my relationships and my life and my opportunities in school and things like that. And they're they're saying that they achieve more in school or work, whatever it is they're doing. So, right? they're, they're, so those are things value. that we think 
yeah, I, yeah, I believe those are good for people. I want people right. to like themselves. I think it's good for you to like I, themselves. I agree. And it seems like what you're saying and what we've talked about before is that there's also, you know, what we can't call objective, but from a societal perspective, a lot of value in people not having mental health challenges and crises. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, you know, that's we're right. not making that jump literally right here in the study that you did because no, we didn't no, measure that. There's but there's lots of work out there showing that yes. you have right. mental health problems when you don't like yourself. Yes. <laughs> when your relationships aren't satisfying, when you haven't decided who you are and what you're here for, like you get, you know, that's not good for you. It totally makes sense. Um, let's take a breather now, though, and step back and take a look at all the connections that. Um, you just helped us make. I mean, this longitudinal study that you and your team engaged in over the six, seven years um, has provided not only connections between you know what you shared in terms of the 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 level at which adolescents are grappling with transcendent thinking uh, and how that connects to the degree of the change in their brains over the ensuing two years, um, and then how that is associated with. Um, the degree of identity development and self-satisfaction that follows when the same adolescents are interviewed even two or so years after that. Um, so you have these four different layers that you've shown connections to that feel incredibly powerful and also have taken me a, a bunch of time to try to you know, integrate into my thinking. So wanted to just pause and take a look at it all here. It is quite an impressive set of findings. Um, and, you know, you've done work here in this set of studies that are being published, and now you're doing other work uh, that can connect to it, but of course isn't exactly the same in terms of the subjects or um, the approaches and, and methods. Um, so we should really talk about that next. And as we make that shift, I, it's worth naming that you have this data set uh, from the longitudinal study, and we're going to be making some leaps, some jumps uh, to other work that you and your team have been doing and that at points I have been a part of. One of the jumps we're making is that we took this set of ideas and we did some observations of teachers in classrooms and talked yeah. to the teach. you talked to the teachers and you talked to some of the kids and you, um, you know, you're, you're, trying to answer a question that I know we are really excited to see if there's a way to answer. We're not even sure, but we're trying, right? We're groping towards uh, whether or not there's even methods to make this make this yeah. um, set of insights kind of come to the surface. And that is like, the, you, you mentioned in this conversation over and over again about the dynamic aspect of growth for people and learning and development, social, uh, cognitive, emotional, and uh, so we tried to we're trying to figure out where there's connections here, right? Not just what teachers are doing, but they themselves are believing and feeling and physiologically how they're handling, right? What's happening in their or responding mm -hmm. to or, or managing themselves mm -hmm. in classroom settings and what that's translating to in terms of kids own experiences. Mm -hmm. Now, so I just want to make sure we're calling out that we don't have a one data set on all of this. You, you did this longitudinal study. Right. That's okay. Yeah, so the longitudinal um, study is different kids than the teacher study. Yeah. So I just want to make sure that's clear. Yeah, that's clear. Someday I'd love to do a study with with the teachers and the kids from the same place. Right. But that would be tried, amazing. And it got this close to being funded, and you know this, and it's like so yeah, crazy. You gotta keep right. working at. Yeah. But I, I just want that's to make sure we're clear. I'm not bitter or anything. Okay. <laughs> we're clearly we're making this sort of skip from that set of ideas and 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 insights from your research on that longitudinal study from kids to 14, 15, all the way to the early 20s. To now this this set of things that we've been working on and that your team is yeah. digging deeper and deeper like the data that you've described to me is just like massive like so many it's, pieces it's overwhelming it's a gigantic sea of <laughs> <laughs> so if you were to pull just a couple of those threads out right now um you know what would you and connect, connect dots to this conversation mm -hmm. what would you mm -hmm. want us to highlight well, what we what we find is that your team doug you know, as, as people know, right, your team went in and observed these teachers in their classroom on a day of their choosing, right, for an hour and debriefed with them and pre-briefed with them and like thought about what are they doing? And you guys, you guys made judgments using the true framework from out of UC Berkeley, right, about like, how do they think about, you know, how are they enacting Teaching for for robust understanding, robust understanding. right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And what we found is that 
when we bring the teachers, so we don't know what you what you said you saw in the data, like we're independent from you as you know, um, until now when we put it all together now that everybody's done, right? Um, what, we, what we find is that there were characteristic ways that teachers, when we brought them to the lab, were talking about their work. So this is the, these are the interviews that Christina led um, as part of her dissertation work where, you know, we worked with your team to come up with questions that would in essence be follow-ups on the things you were trying to witness in the classroom. So like, how do you think about um, equitable access to content for your students? How do you think about formative assessment? How do you think about agency and ownership um, uh, of knowledge it, for your classes, right? That kind of stuff. So we're asking them, why did you become a teacher, right? Um, so we're asking them to tell us about how they make sense of their work. And what we found is that there were sort of, even though all the teachers in the study were identified by their administrators as being really great, okay? And so, um, but we see this big range. First of all, you saw a big range in the way that teachers were enacting their practices. And we saw that those that range of enactment was related to the ways teachers were conceptualizing the purpose of their work. And, and let and me that, just interject, Mary Helen, that the teachers were yeah. grades six through 12 and all sorts of disciplines, right? I remember being- Yeah, on purpose. We made sure we covered all the, all the disciplines from gym teacher to math to English right. language arts. And what we found is that there was a big range in the level of understanding, again, the teacher's levels of understanding mirror the developmental trajectory that we're talking about here for the youth. So, you know, the teachers could have these more sort of instrumental transactional ways of understanding their role, um, where they're responsible for what kids know. They need to manage, you know, like the, the, the giving of resources so that kids can ingest those resources and, and then no stuff, right? Um, and then there were teachers who kind of thought about their work in more and more complex ways, uh, developmentally speaking. And what we mean by that is um, they were uh, talking about their own role and what they actually do, you know, in not only in terms of what the kid will learn or take from that, but also in terms of the dynamic developmental trajectory that they're facilitating a kid getting onto, right? So they're seeing their work as, an, as a kind of invitation for the kid to, to be able to grow themselves along a particular kind of trajectory. And they see that their work is to infuse resources and opportunities and feedback in ways that help a kid get onto a healthy trajectory of learning and development over time. And so there are many stages to that and different characteristic narratives that you can pull out at different stages that I think are really interesting to talk about with teachers, right? This kind of transactional one, and then uh, what, you know, I give you something, you give me something back, right? And that's what teaching is in this kind of context. These are all low SES public schools, by the way, um, at, you know, public schools working in low SES communities. Uh, but then, you know, next to kind of a gatekeeper where like, I give you, I know what's in the world and I'm standing between you and the con and the world. So I'm going to strategically give you content, right? So there's a little bit more complexity because I'm thinking about something bigger than just like, I give you this, you give me that, right? It's more like, I'm giving you this and you give me back that because I'm gatekeeping so that you can, um, you can not be overwhelmed, not be, you know, you know, too frustrated, not be, you know, like I can decide what's appropriate for you and I can feed that to you at just the rate I think you can handle, right? So I'm kind of gatekeeping the world for you, which is, which recognizes some kind of capacity building on the part of the student that you're facilitating, but it's a very simple kind of way to think about that, right? Um, and then like more complex even narratives, narratives that become even more developmentally infused, I would say, are ones where the teacher's showing that they are not gatekeeping, but appreciating something about the student's perspective on their own world and deciding how to orchestrate or provide supports and opportunities and resources and curriculum around being responsive to that student's needs and perspective. And then the sort of fully self-actualized kind of teacher 
is the one who's able to not put themselves kind of in the position of being the provider, but instead they become the facilitator of the kid growing themselves through the content. And they talk about how they skillfully strategically lay out opportunities and invite the kids in, and then they sort of adjust and respond to the student so that the student can then build themselves optimally within the space of the opportunities their, their, their classroom provides. Which is a which is a, which is a more sort of developmentally situated, trajectory oriented, process oriented way of understanding the learning. So you start at the beginning with this notion of you know learning is like an incremental thing, and I'm trying to give it to you in bite sized chunks so you can move up the ladder, right? And at the end, it's that learning is really an adaptive process. It's a set of capacities that you learn how to enact. And I'm setting you up with a world that will you'll be able to develop those capacities in. And and so those are those are four what you just described as narratives. The levels of and and those narratives kind of describing like describing their work and and those related. We're working on this now. The data we're working on this now, but they related in all kinds of interesting ways to the ways that students were um, feeling in their class. So we gave out questionnaires like. Uh, tripod questionnaire where students were talking about how they felt challenged and cared for and all the stuff mm -hmm. in that teacher's class. Um, and it related to that. So the, so, the, so the practices that you guys observed only explained some of the variants and how the kids experience things. These narratives are actually explaining other variants, as is the physiological regulatory capacity teachers bring into that space, which tells us something about the social enactment of the curriculum, right? So, you know, before, before we go there, Mary Helen, I want to better understand the narratives piece, because I've been struggling with this, actually, as you and I have been talking about the last month or so. Um, so. Teachers told you how they think about teaching, right? Mm -hmm. And that's how where they think these, about their work. Yeah, they right. think about how they work. do what they do, why they do it like that, what they and think about it, how they understand you, their kids. You were able to code or Christine was able to code, you know, their responses into these kind of four larger categories that have mm -hmm. increasing complexity to them. And and as I'm understanding it, mediate some of the connections of the data like that. Yeah, we're still working on the statistics there. So there's various things. So one of the reasons that this but is when you say funny. explain some of this and this explains other that's not necessarily oh, that's like added, that's statistics talk so yeah if i put this in the model and say like if i predict students answers to these questionnaires about how they feel in the class does this correlate with it it does but if i put also their physiological regulatory does do the two still both correlate right, right. or are they actually the same thing statistically speaking like they're, they're stepping on each other's variants like Right. The teachers who do things more are also the regulated ones, so then it's all the same to the kid, right? But we can show that you can additively explain more and more of the of what kids are saying, you know, Got it. Of, the, of the variance of the of the you know variability in what kids are saying based on all these different measures. So what that's it why you were bringing that, that they're all contributing to the kids' experience. That's just, why you're bringing the physiology piece into it as well. Now I understand yeah. where you're going. Sorry, I wasn't yeah, following exactly okay. where you're So the you're physiology going. is we think a, a, a kind of a we're doing a vagal tone, which is a kind of marker for high frequency variability, which is associated with emotional and social health, also physical embodied health. But mm -hmm. it's it's also associated with a kind of why social health because it's associated with a kind of responsivity, an ability to manage yourself in real time in social contexts, um, uh, and and affectively sort of regulate yourself in accordance with the the context in which you're you know you're currently in. And what we found, uh, and then also autonomic system, right? There's lots of things, but we also find that sort of. Um, the kind of physiological signature of stress is interfering. So if the teacher is showing a physiological sign that they are stressed in the measurements we do right before the class starts kind of thing, right? Then, then students are also perceiving that above and beyond what you could notice in their practices. So, so the teacher's own wellness and, and capacities for that are associated, I should say, with with social self-management, affective engagement that's appropriate, 
are additionally being felt by the kids as challenge and care above and beyond what you and your team in an hour could notice. So there's some kind of relational patterning in there that the kids are sensing somehow, which is related to the teacher's own ability to manage themselves in that social space, which is also related to them not feeling stressed in that social space. Um, and what's really kind of interesting from a physiological standpoint is that the, um, the, the teacher's baseline physiological measurements that we took in the lab, for example, when like you sit in a quiet room, this is like the, this is the really high quality measurements, right? So you sit in a quiet room and just sort of rest sort of semi reclined in a comfortable chair and we do these baselines for five minutes. Those don't tell us anything about your kid, how your kids are gonna perceive your class. It's the baselines we take in the five minutes prior to the class starting, right? Where we're like, oh, the kids are just coming in. Can, can you just sit quietly to try to close your eyes and, and relax? And we're just gonna get some baseline measures really quick. Like when the kids are actually coming into the room and we're all watching in the video cameras, are, those are the measures that are predicting, right? It's the teachers who can actually manage themselves in the context of the teaching. We also see um, a sort of mirror of that when the, kid, when the teachers are in the lab, the baselines in the lab don't predict, but the measurements that we take when they're actually describing their own teaching, when we say like, okay, so tell us how you think about agency. And we, you know, we saw in your class that you, you know, called on Doug, even though his hand wasn't up, like, tell us about why you did that, right? Those kinds of questions, but we bring them mentally back into the teaching context. Again, the physiological regulation there is, um, is, is, is uh, predicting how the kids experience that person's class. So it tells you that teaching, like teachers are not going to be surprised by this at all. Teachers are not automatons who just enact practices, right? That's okay. That's something you gotta know. You gotta know how to do your craft, right? If you don't know how to do stuff, you're in a bad place too. I'm not suggesting that at all. But that's not enough. You also have to be able to read and relate with and interact with kids in a, in a way that makes those kids feel genuinely challenged and cared for by you. And that is something that I think the teaching profession knows, but that the legislators and the policymakers don't fully appreciate. Thank you. Um, I mean, I'm so fascinated to find uh, more out about what you're going to be piecing together with your team. I guess the, the so much, so much. <laughs> I guess the last thing I'm wondering about is, are there emerging? I mean, you know, I, I think if I turn this around and to ask the educators I work with at this point, they would have a lot to suggest of like, what what kind of practices do we think? and ways of being as teachers. Um, do we think would actually kind of grow this growth, you know, when kid, you know, grow this these capacities for the the growth that we're hoping for in this work in the brain and as people? Um, are there are there anything any things that are emerging that are your, you know, your team is seeing or pointing to or that are implied in certain ways? Um, around practice, you know, and again, I just want to remind folks who hear this, like we're talking about secondary age kids, we're talking about adolescents, we're not talking about little ones. Um, I think some of the same things might hold the little ones, but this is a very specific kind of skill set. I think there would be parallel findings in younger, in teachers of younger children, but the actual instantiation of those practices and the things that would count as appropriate social regulation in those spaces would be different, right? You don't treat right. a teenager like a three-year-old, and you right. don't treat it to be a, like a teenager, but in both places, you have to have skills for appropriately interacting with a kid from that developmental sort of stage. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned uh, recently that the relationship kind of between abstract and concrete thinking and work has some interesting, um, you know, connections that may seem intuitive, but then there's some that don't, right? That are that are like you see. I can't remember that that the, tr the the three categories you mentioned recently that someone on your team is working with a whole huge data set around AI, you know, kind of like the large language models of feeding all this information into the system and kind of found three different categories and connections between these things. Is that something that's worth talking about or you feel like it's yeah, too early? Yeah, I think that stuff is really um, early stages. We're still playing around. And also those analyses, I just realized right now I kind of got an idea for a new analysis I should have to do. Yeah, right. Those are on the like the amount of transcendent thinking versus amount of concrete thinking and looking at those things together. But each transcendent and concrete has a whole bunch of stuff that goes into each one, right? 
and yeah. like some kids are transcendent by trying to think about the systems level stuff like why is there immigration systems like i never understood why if you're born over here you can't do stuff over there and like that's something i always wondered like said what get right that's a different kind of transcendence than a kid who says like this is not right all humans should have opportunity right that's a different kind of place to go with it versus like I wonder if what this means for me, I should try to be more grateful to my own parents because I never realized how much they actually, right? Like that's a different kind of transcendence, you know, taking the perspective of there's many kinds and there's also many kinds of concrete thinking. So like, oh, I feel so bad for her. Others are like, I think she should have done this instead of that, right? Like right. more advice giving. All of these things are stuck in the context, but they're very different flavors and or all of them are transcendent but they're very different flavors and that's i think why we're able to have such incredible developmental predictive power is because we've managed to sort of wrangle a real world this is something that actually probably does kind of exist in the world because there's enough variation allowed for within the construct itself which is not how scientists usually think we get a lot of pushback from people saying like oh this is a theory of everything this is a whatever i'm like yeah. hey, maybe this <laughs> why wouldn't that be great right i mean it's like Right. There's a flavor to it that's different for concrete and for abstract that the, 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 the defining feature is very clear. It's a very broad. They're both very broad constructs, but they're very clear constructs. One pertains to the context. One pertains to things that aren't in the context that are like the ideas about the context. And that is the defining feature. And scientists have some scientists have a lot of trouble with that. They're like, but you need right. to. It's got executive control and everything just all thrown in together. Well, I'm like, all right, exactly. That's the point. And that's, that's how that's how we like, work. Yeah, we're predicting brain development that you can't hope to with IQ, right? And so, I mean, I think that that's actually, in some way, the innovation is to think about how things kind of hang. But what we could do with these, um, okay, so back to the question you had, what we find it looks like in both the teachers and the students that high concrete thinking, is kind of undermining growth over time. That's growth what it means, like growth it meaning being able to also do the transcendent, you marshalling that concreteness to. Yeah, to you the, don't yeah. find kids with super high concrete thinking who also have super high transcendent thinking, right? Uh, but you do find kids with high transcendent with low concrete, low transcendent, low concrete. You know, you find kids that have various mixes, but it seems like there's something special with if you have a lot of concrete thinking, you're sort of stuck. Right. And even if you have low transcendent thinking, if you also have low concrete thinking, you're less stuck, it looks like. But the sort of settling too quickly into overly concrete interpretations of the world in our data seems to be undermining brain development and psychosocial development, even though the concrete stuff at the beginning is associated with good relationships and you know, diversity, right. acceptance of diversity and stuff like that. So there's something there. But what I should do, what she just gave me the idea to do, is actually give Amir Hussain, the, the postdoc is working on this, uh, using mathematical modeling of these dynamics over time, give him all the raw data, like all the ways you can take perspective, all the way, right, get, do all those scores instead of just, instead of just like, okay, we've summed it up into two big scores. Like, let's let him play in the full soup and see whether there are particular combinations of, concrete and abstract or concrete and transcendent thinking that are particularly generative or particularly undermining of growth or things like that. That sounds exciting. Um, I, so you know, I think do that. the takeaway, the takeaway for me, not, you know, fully hearing that you're saying you don't have a conclusion at this point, you're just seeing some emerging. Yeah, patterns. we're playing with the patterns. We're trying to um, figure out, and keep in mind also, it's a very modestly sized sample. You know, we don't have 10,000 right. kids because you can't for a work like this, right? Well, I guess the thing I would, you know, we can wrap up here is because we've been talking for a good chunk of time. I, yeah. It's, to, we've come back to it numerous times. It's like, what will grow the brain in ways that appear to be associated with a lot of, you know, positive health indicators, mental health and, and identity pieces is, is this, a, is, is this, um, doing more of, I shouldn't say capability because everybody has the capability, the doing more of the, the abstract and the you know the transcendent thinking that is the marshalling of the concrete and i think you know what you just said is that um i mean you can't do one without the other is the implicit thing that you just said you don't have high abstract and zero concrete there's no if such you thing. do that's not great because oh. 
high okay. abstract and zero. Yeah, I mean, then you're just all in the big platitudes, right? But right. you don't have any instantiating sort of evidence. And so you don't know how to recognize them in the world. You know, if you just say, well, uh, truths be whatever, like some big, you know, something like that, like that's not, that's not going to help you you know, grow yourself in, a, in an instrumental way. You have to actually be working in this in the space. But let me say something else. It's not exactly more of it. I think it's lear it, it looked like more in our data set, the way we measured it for this age group in this context, right? Okay. Where arguably doing more of this would be good for you in this context. I'm giving you 40 super interesting stories about kids. Great chance to learn things about the world. You're going to take it or you're just going to sit there, right? Uh, or just react in this superficial sort of action-oriented way, right? But out in the real world and the dynamics of the gigantic, you know, realities of life, it's not more is better. I mean, Gandhi was probably super high on transcendence. He was also probably, super, all accounts, you know, kind of super bad at, you know, the little concrete details and very difficult to live with, right? For the people around you, right? So, I mean, like you want what, what looks like, and, and that's great, that's a kind of genius, right? And he had a huge impact on the world. But what, what you really want for well-being is is a is a, the ability to notice what is called for in what situation so that the ability to manage yourself into and out of these transcendent and more concrete context dependent states that's what we think is going to lead to health not just more of the big ethereal stuff just because yeah. right um so you know the this the little trite example i used to explain this is like me in the grocery store you know what i mean i'm going along and i have half an hour to go shopping or whatever it is you know, I'm buying the Cheerios. But I know I always buy this brand of bread. My kid's not allergic to it. It's like, it's healthy. I, I read the instructions, once, you know, the ingredients once. And I know I'm like, bam, 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 in the cart, right? But you get to the fish aisle or something, the fish counter, and you stop and think, which of these is the sustainably, you right, harvested thing? Which of these is, um, you know, bad for the environment? Which of the, right? Or you get to the fruit, and I live in Southern California, and I think, okay, I don't need to buy blueberries that have been floated halfway around the world with fossil fuels because I know our own blueberries are gonna be coming in soon, right? So I'm gonna choose something else, right? So you have to know under what circumstances is it worthwhile to think about the bigger idea and under what circumstances do you just need to get stuff done? And noticing which is which, developing a kind of wisdom for navigating yourself through that space, that is, I think, the ideal. Not being uber transcendent all the time, which is Got just it. not very efficient at getting anything done. Well, and what I'm also hearing throughout this conversation is what concrete pieces are actually feeding into that thinking. Yeah, and that we don't really know. Yeah. Well, yeah. and and I can imagine they're really important. If you you know yeah. like what, what choices we are making as educators around the the skills, the concepts, yeah. yeah, the the way we build relationships or indicate to others that we you know think that what people are doing are the right ways of you know kind of relating with each other, those those are that's part of the fuel of the transcendent think you obviously can't do the transcendent thinking without pieces of things that you yeah, you're better, that's right better you're also. not really doing it you, you might come out with a transcendent platitude right right but you don't actually have the capacity to understand what it would look like in a in 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 a context in a specific yeah. context so just so being reflective happening. just being saying we're going to have time to reflect is for example, is not necessarily going to be the thing, even if you're trying to build that muscle right in the brain or whatever the metaphor, mixed metaphor I'm using. Um, it does very, very much matter what we're, what people are are excited about, kind of the, on the emotional side of things, as well as like the things that you're, we're curating and 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 shaping as teachers in terms of curriculum um, and experiences kids are having. So, and I would say that's got to be the same for adults, right? When we're thinking about school leaders, thinking about shaping the experiences of the of the the faculty and the adults in the community. It's, yeah, we're humans too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and again, like just to take it back to teachers, great teachers don't just have the big, you know, meaningful reasons why they've done, chosen that life course and like hopes for all the future of youth, but they have no idea how to teach you how to read, right? You have to have both and you have to know which one matters here and now and when do I invoke one versus the other, right? That's what it's about. Well, let's pause. Um, yeah. I would say end, but I know we'll continue to talk. Oh, there's so much uh, more, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I, you know, this is a bit of a marathon here today. So thanks for taking that time. Yeah.
Thank you. It's super interesting and fun.